Hello, everyone. Hello, this is Rich, and you are watching Indie Plus. This is one of our monthly panel series. Uh, this series, uh, this this episode or panel is about beginnings, uh, beginnings of a tabletop RPG game session or the beginning of a mini series, a con session, a one shot. Uh, it could also be the beginning of a campaign. Uh, so first of all, I'll let you know this is part of the Indie Plus, uh, and here's to the community standards of Indie Plus. If you want to find out more about those standards, please go to indieplus.org and you'll find them. Before this panel began, uh, I did through the Indie Plus account on Google Plus post out a request for questions, and we received a number of them from some of the followers uh, who have Indie Plus circled. However, if you don't hear the question that interests you the most, uh, then feel free, if you're watching this live, which is the uh, 27th of June, 2015, if you're watching live and you want to submit a question, I'll do my best to prioritize that among all the questions that we have for this up to an hour long panel. If you get this, it is well after the 27th of June and you still have a question, we watch it all the way through and there's something that the expert panelists here could tell you that you want to know. Feel free to ask that question in the YouTube comments and I'll do my best to either track them down or track down other smart people who can speak to that for you. So uh, I will now bring on our wonderful panelists, and I'll do it in the only egalitarian way I can think of, which is also easy for me because it's alphabetical, and that's how they're listed on the Hangout for me. First, we have Bree Sheldon, who is uh, from the Indie Syndicate, which is part of IGDN, and she also has the wonderful five questions that asks lots of cool and popular people in the gaming circuit. How are you, Bree? I'm doing okay. Good, good, good. Uh, and then next we have uh, the L5R guy, as he, he's known. Uh, he's also content director for the GM Academy, contributor on RPG Academy, and also loosely affiliated with the One Shot podcast, Jim McClure. How are you, Jim? I'm good, doing outstanding. I, I guess we have to say loosely affiliated, and yeah, everyone seems to call me the L5R guy, because I guess that's all I'm capable of doing, so I accept it. I will take it. Yes, yeah, so the RPG Academy and Team Academy, all within the filter of L5R, right? That's Clearly, the, the best system, absolutely. Right, right, cool. Uh, next we have uh, Kristen Firth, who is a game designer and frequent convention GM, as well as one of the organizers of Games on Demand at Gen Con, and she ran a game for me at Origins. How are you doing, Kristen? I'm doing great. Good, good. And last but not least, we have Mad J. Brown, who is the best Star Wars Edge of the Empire GM I personally know, specifically because I've only had Cat Murphy on one podcast, so I don't know her, know her. I just listen to campaign podcasts. But Mad J. is just the, the demon at Star Wars Edge of the Empire. How are you doing, Mad J.? I'm pretty good. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good. All right. Well, uh, so we have, uh, as I said, some questions, but feel free to post if you have some that you would like to uh, to get in. The first one is from Richard Williams, uh, and Richard asked, a lot of games have great relationship setups like Fiasco and Monster Hearts, but often they falter when play begins. How do you get over this hump, and, and how do you encourage players to bring elements from the setup into the game? Um, Matt Jay, can we start off with you on that? No, sure, sure. Um, for me, if you're having that conversation, uh, especially with Monster Hearts or Fiasco, the characters, uh, the setup, um, as the the facilitator, you got to keep bringing that stuff back in. You have to lead the way. So I, I would address the characters or the players by the character names. Um, during setup, I'm writing down or I'm making notes of all the relationships, all the, the NPCs or, or relationships that the, they thrown out. Um, and you got to keep pulling that back and reincorporating that in, in the scenes as, as you move along until the players pick it up and they start doing the same thing. So I think you have to lead by example. Cool, cool. Bree, what, what about you? How do you try to reincorporate those relationship elements? Um, probably the biggest thing I do whenever I'm either running or playing is I try to use aggressive scene framing. Um, Whenever a player says that they have an idea or they start be beginning a conversation as part of the game, I'll say, who else do you want to be in this scene? And do you remember this? Or what is missing, basically? And try and get them to put together the pieces to make the scene more consistent and strongly connected with the other players. Cool. Kristen, what, what about you? Um, I'll talk about Fiasco in particular, since that was mentioned in the question. Um, and I've done a lot of that. Um, 
I think one of the things you want to do there is strike a good balance between how much you define ahead of time and how much you define in game. Um, tables are different, and you kind of want to just watch what's going on. Some people want to define everything, and that's not good because if two people start talking about all the reasons they argue, they can't actually, you know, argue in a scene. They'll just be rehashing it. But on the other hand, if they don't set up some of the basics, they won't have that like foundation to build on. So I think it's a matter of if people aren't defining enough, ask some questions, uh, like fill out those details that are on the cards just a little bit more so you have something to go on. Um, and yeah, just, just try to just strike that balance and then people will have something but not everything defined so you can start exploring those relationships in the scenes. Cool, cool. Um, Jim, what about you? How, how do you make sure that those relationship aspects are reincorporated? How, how do I follow up the three perfect answers? Hmm, that's a tough one. Uh, no, I, I mean, I, pretty much, I, I agree with just about, I mean, everything was said. I mean, the big thing in, in a game that you're playing that has a lot of front-loaded setup that is player-driven, you know, like we're talking about, all of the hard work is done for the DM. The players are required to give you the things that motivate them to play the game. There's the whole keys to the kingdom right there dropped in front of you, and the big thing is just going... What they've given me, the player's story, is more important than my story. You know, if, if the players give me, I, you know, I, I run a lot more typical fantasy setting, but, you know, if the players give me that in their story, you know, they're chasing after, you know, the, this religious sect and they have whatever, their father, their mother, the sword, whatever the MacGuffin that they want, and that's their character motivation. And in the story that I had sat and planned ahead of time, they were going to deal with a, with a cult that had this thing. Well, I just reskinned the cult to the religious sect, and now they have a direct to drive into what I was planning. The player's story story is more important than my story, and in a system like that, I think the biggest key to keeping those thread lines going through is it's not, okay, here's the setup, now I'm using that to get them interested in the world to play my story. It's taking that information going, now let me present them the story that they want based on what they gave me. One thing I forgot, if I could jump in, Rich, um, the... In something like Fiasco or something where the players have sort of set up their own characters and relationships and things, it's also good to, right before you start playing, review that. Like, you might have taken a break, you might have done a lot of details about different things, so just kind of quickly going over, here's who's at the table, here's the relationships that we set up, um, and if need be, do that again kind of halfway through the game. Um, so, a little tip. <laughs> cool, cool. Actually, um, that, that Fiasco thing, one of the things I like about it is, is that actually index cards often physically on there to help remind mm -hmm. people I've, I've seen that in the past, and that's, that's helped me because I'm forgetful. Uh, Lowell, Francis had a question. Uh, Bree, if, if I could, I'd like to tap you to, to lead us off here. How much setting and backstory do you usually do in session one? How much do you do before that session began begins? And do you, do you hand out material before a game starts, or... Give the brief in like a conversation. How, how do you handle that? Typically, the games I have run in the past, I have tried to do as little beforehand prep as possible. Um, I prefer to sit down with the players and have them create settings, and that way I can make sure that they're actually invested in it. Um, I have, in a couple of instances, started with themes or. Um, like a general idea of the setting, like we're going to do like a steampunk world set in X period, or uh, let's do cyberpunk, and that's where we're going to go with that. But as far as, you know, villains and NPCs and all that kind of things, um, I try to have the characters create as much as possible because then they're dependent on having those story elements involved. Well, Jim, in uh, more established settings, like, I don't know, Legend of the Five Rings, how much prep work do you expect from your players? <laughs> Legend of Fiber, I think I know that system. I've played it once or twice. <laughs> um, prep work from players, I mean, with an established setting like Legend of Five Rings, um, it, it does come very much front-loaded with the system. Uh, you know, when I ran it for, for the one-shot guys, you know, it was I was the only one at the table that ever played L5R before. They're all experienced gamers, but not only played the system before, and it does come with a lot of front-loaded expectations before we get to the table to first start playing. I actually have a, a, a write-up for, for just this thing, because I've taken more than one group of people through L5R, 
for some reason. Um, but it, it's almost 32 pages worth of reading before you even get to any sort of mechanics. It's just this is what you have to know to play. And and there's good and bad things on you know a a setting heavy game that you're going to roll um, because if the players are actually committed to it, um, you know, and they go through all of this process, then they are really engaged. They are really immersed into the world, into the story bef before we say go and, and have our first die roll. Um, you know, now on the other side is it, it is a lot more work. I mean, it, it is not as easy as just, I shouldn't say easy, I was going to say, as showing up to the table, it's, there is a lot of preloaded work that is put on the players, and a preloaded work that is put on the GM to know and understand all of this. Do I think it can be done phenomenally well? Absolutely. Uh, I'm a big proponent of that. Uh, obviously, that's not the only way to game, but but it is, you know, a, a difference. So, I mean, the core of your question as far as with doing a preloaded setting, I'm personally a big fan of it because it gives a rich, immersive world that the players get to experience even before they hit that first play session. Cool, cool. Now, Kristen, I know you mostly focus on one-shots, games on demand, so there's not like an expectation of stuff after that, but do you ever do any pre-prep? Say someone says there's a particular game they want run at games uh, at a game on demand or for a one-shot. Anything that, that you do as far as a prep before? Uh, well, I usually just prep stuff that I think is fun for me. Like if I'm doing Fiasco, I'll choose one or two play sets that I haven't played before that I'm interested in doing again um, and kind of limit the choice. Uh, but kind of along along these lines, since there is uh, such a short amount of time and talking about buy-in, um, I think it's really important if you're doing a one-shot or a con game to clearly set expectations at the very top and say this is going to be this kind of game. There might be this kind of content warning, um, stuff like that, so that if anyone who's there wasn't quite expecting that from the little description they, ran, they read, um, they'll know whether it's their thing or not. Uh, so it's one of the things we talk about sometimes at some of the Games on Demand training, is like, as soon as you can at the beginning say, hey, this is the kind of game, this is the kind of theme, these are the sort of things we're going to be exploring. If this wasn't your cup of tea, you know, go choose another game. It's not going to gonna break things, um, and then you don't have to sit there for two hours or four hours and something that isn't your isn't your thing that you don't want to be there for? Yeah, especially in games on demand, you have to pay for the tickets, man. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what, Jay, what about prep for players? You know, backstory, that kind of stuff before session one. Um, I'm I'm horrible, man. I I put everything on uh, the zero session. Um, the the talk about playing the game. Um, I depend on. Uh, so, and you know this. We just we just did this with Star Wars. We did an online hangouts thing where we talked about what we're going to play, and everyone had input. Everyone got to say the things that they were excited about for Star Wars, uh, the stuff that uh, they wanted to play. We talked about everybody's characters and things. I depend on that session to kind of set everything else up. Uh, without that, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I need I need uh, it's it's jazz. Everyone's bringing something to the table and, and riffing. And I can go do something with that. Otherwise, I'm I'm one guy doing something in the dark, and that that'll turn out horrible. Yeah, yeah, gaming in the dark. I mean, especially well, if it's audio only, I guess it's not so bad. Uh, so we'll, we'll move on. We've got another question. This is from a a Abram. I'm sorry, I may mess up your name. If anyone here on the hangout can, is it Boussier? Would you, is that how you guess his last name? Anyone? No, I'll leave it with Pussier. Okay. Pretty How... rich. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. How do you best start a game where you know none of the players? The intended length of the game make a difference for how you should do that. Well, I'll jump in on this. Um, this is one of the things I do have a fair amount of experience with um, because, of course, on, on top of doing a lot of different... Um, uh, podcast shows and things like that, I often find myself playing with groups of tables that I have never played before, and when Roll20 went live, I spent about a year just running uh, Tabletop, actually, 4th edition D&D, um, for people who had never played Tabletop before. So I was every single month starting a new campaign with people who had never played. Um, and as, as far as how to go into dealing with that, um, you know, I'm not saying, again, this is the, the only way to do it, but my way is... I, they do not get as much freedom as a normal game in that I come in and tell them, here is what this game is going to be. 
not what would you like because they're new. You know, they don't haven't played tabletop before. They don't know tabletop. I am going to give them an experience that they can enjoy. And and for the fourth edition games that I, I was running for new players, it was come in. We are going to do a a moderate 50-50 role play, 50-50 combat. We're going to end with a bit of a dungeon crawl, and that's going to be your experience. Now, the reason is, is because, again, someone that is new to tabletop, they don't know whether or not they enjoy a dungeon crawl. They don't know whether or not they enjoy a role play. They don't know whether or not they enjoy the combat of 4th edition. So I give them an experience that has a little taste of everything so they can help define their terms. So the big difference I have when I'm dealing with a group of players that have never played before is it's not so much a okay, what would you guys like to do? Then it is a, okay, here's the experience I'm going to give you. Let's see what you enjoy. Cool, I like that mix. Now, Kristen, uh, Games on Demand, I, I mean, you've got to work for lots and lots of <laughs> people. So how, how do you support Well, uh, uh, to reiterate what I said earlier, uh, just in case, um, really setting setting the tone and the content of what you're about to get into is, is super important um, so that everyone's kind of on the same page. You don't want half people to be like, hey, this is wild, jokey, fun time, and the other half to be, I want a so serious emotional journey because that's going to clash really hard, really fast. Um, another thing, I'm just going to be like safety girl. Uh, in addition to content warnings, you probably want to have some kind of safety talk. Uh, a tool like John uh X card is great for conventions with people that you don't know. Uh, with new people, it, it gives you that, that safety net that you kind of want um, in, in any kind of situation with random new people. Uh, and then just personally, I think uh, you should try to have uh, confidence if you can if you're a GM. Even if you don't feel very confident, if you fake it, people won't realize that you're not actually confident uh, as long as you're pretending. Um, and your job isn't you know, to give everyone a perfect time. It's just to play a game and to share this experience. So uh, you can kind of keep that in mind and, and know you're there as facilitator. That helps. All right, Jay, what, what about you? How do you handle the, the newbies in establishing that relationship at table? This is, uh, yeah, this is sounds a lot like the con, ex con experience. And for me, I mean, if I'm picking the game and I know the, the time frame, um, the rest is setting the player's expectations and uh, kind of laying out an outline of what we're doing. And I'll, I'll do that. Uh, I run a lot of Burning Wheel at cons, and I get a lot of newbies that come out. And I'll break down like a four-hour period. Here's what we're doing the first hour. We're going to spend the next two hours doing this. The last hour, here's our wrap-up, and how, here's how this will happen. Um, once I lay out the expectations and everyone's good, um, then you know I jump right into whatever it is we're playing. I lay out the situation. Um, and kind of feel everybody out, see where everyone is uh, as we move along through the whole process. So I think for me, most of it is outlining the time that we have and setting the expectations. Cool, cool. Bree, what about you? How do you establish the that new relationship with players and start it off? A lot of my games have been um, games that came on demand or uh, similar setups where it's all brand new players. And um, personally, I have social anxiety, so it's a big challenge for me. So if you have that, it's good to prep ahead of time for you to deal with it, um, even more than having players deal with it. Uh, but like Kristen mentioned, um, I use tools like the X card and one of my own tools called Script Change. Um, and Script Change involves uh, three cards, one that says Fast Forward, one that says Rewind, and one that says Pause. And I tell people to use it both for content and for story. So whenever we start the game, people can fast forward over something they don't want to see all the details of, in case it's like gory or something like that. They can rewind and redo a scene if it bothers them or they don't like the storyline that's happening. Or they can pause and take a break. And establishing those boundaries up front is how I get the players to trust each other. And we have, you know, a detailed like interface with each other about um, what kind of content is okay, what you want to ban basically from the table, including like I don't want to see aliens, I don't want to see undead, or you know I don't want to see sexual assault, I don't want to see you know super detailed gore. And then we talk about you know what people want to include in the game, and make sure that we kind of put together all of the content to meet those goals. And it typically works pretty well in my experience. Cool, cool. Now, uh, Bree, if you could, there was a second half to the question that Abram, ha 
Abram had asked, and I'll kind of lead off with here. Now, contrary to the new player, new situation, how do you how do you handle after game startup based on what you've learned about the players? That actually is harder to me to answer because um, I haven't run a lot of long term games. Um, those that I have run, um, I try to keep some notes on what I learned about the players from the first game. And I ask people to keep their own notes if they have stuff that they want to bring up in the future. And typically, that has worked pretty well um, because people have the important things to them that they write down. And they'll often bring it up whenever I'm discussing what we're going to do for the session. Cool. Well, Jim, you run, like with Legend of the Five Rings and other games, they're, they're very campaign-oriented. So how do you build off of that initial startup and, and the player meet and greet to go forward with that in future sessions? What do you make sure to keep kind of an eye towards? Oh, I, I am I am kind of crazy on this one, actually. Because, uh, yes, uh, L5 War is, is definitely more towards our long-running campaigns. I personally prefer long-running campaigns. I love the long-running campaign. The longer, the longer, the better. Um, and, and okay, uh, w w without taking up the next hour and a half explaining what all it is, what I actually keep notes on on my players as I go through is something called the eight types of fun. This was a, an article put out by Mark LeBlanc way back in 2001 that asserts that there's only eight types of fun a player can have. I told you I was going crazy on you. I warned you beforehand. I literally keep my players' names in front of me, the eight types of fun, and every time they engage with them, that's my notes because I'm looking for what they actually engage with. Are they engaging with challenge type fun? Are they engaging with narrative? Are they engaging with self-expression? Are they engaging with discovery? Are they engaging with um, you know any of the other types? And that's actually what I do because then I can tailor my experience and going this person is always jumping to the narrative they always want to do something that's engaged in story they are a narrative type player or this person is dealing with combat and even in a social situation that they're always trying to, to quote unquote win and they're a challenge type of player um, so then I can see what types of fun most interest uh, most want to engage my players and I can sort of craft my campaign based on not only what's happening but scenes that will engage those types of fun so I, I, I go a little crazy with it um, in a little bit different route, but that's actually what I do in long-running campaigns to, to see what is actually at a core level motivating my players. Now, Jim, I need to know, do you have a spreadsheet where you track this? Uh, no, no I, I, I am so, this is weird considering we're like on the internet and in the future right now, um, but I am so about hard papers and writing everything down. So I am 100%, I, am I have my notepads of data in front of me, and it's all paper, baby. All right, but but I'm assuming then it's on graph paper, and so you have like an eight by six grid. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. everything has to be perfect in its own little box, clearly. <sighs> okay, I was getting nervous there, you know, a little loosey goosey. <laughs> it, can't, it can't be willy nilly. Come on now. All right, Kristen, I know you you run a lot of one shots, but maybe with the same group. So what's your input on this? Uh, I'm going to continue my having my Miss Safety hat on and say that even if you're with a table full of people that you already know really well from different settings, uh, if you're all sitting down to play a game together for the first time, uh, it's good to have that content and safety check-in. Uh, you might be tempted to skip it because it's like, oh, I know these people. We all know what an X card is. We all know what this game is about. But that's not necessarily always true. Um, and there could be content that for some reason that day is uh, bothering somebody when maybe on a previous day it wasn't. So uh, yeah, it's really great to just sort of do that check-in um, and not, not skip over the part of this is the kind of game we're going to play and this is the safety tools that we have. What about you, Jay? How, how do you go forward? I mean, I need to know because we haven't had the first session. So really, this is a selfish question. I asked all the other people first so you wouldn't know. And I just want to know what's going to happen. No, for me, it's the same. At the end of every session, uh, I try to make sure there's enough time. And we'll go around Robin, and I'll ask everyone, you know, what uh, what what their intentions are uh, for their characters for the next session. What was cool? What are, you, what are you pursuing? What are you chasing in the next session when we get together? What? would you like to see more of? So we kind of have, I get that feedback at the end of every session. And so I can kind of set up where we're going in the next session, maybe the next two or three sessions, especially if we've got four or five people, that's a lot of stuff coming from everybody. But it gets everybody talking, and then sometimes uh, in that dialogue, they put bigger plans together. And I'm listening, all I'm doing is listening at that point and uh, recording everything down so I, I can figure out what we're doing 
uh, over time. So um, it's, it's tough because on on Hangouts you don't have smoke breaks. That used to be back in the day how I would hear all of the players' plans is I would go stand out while they would smoke, and that's when I would know which things actually they cared about. Right, right, right. Because they didn't think I was there because I wasn't smoking, so I didn't care. No, it's, a, it's amazing. Even at the table now, if you start the seed of a conversation, players will run with it. And then all you have to do is just record it down, write it down, keep it in your head someplace. And they put it all right out there in front of you. That's true. That's true. Um, you know, one thing that I found interesting is the Roses and Thorns is an idea that I think Mark Diaz Truman did for me, and I thought it was fantastic. But you have to kind of... You can't just say I'm going to do roses and thorns because I, I did it with an inter, intercontinental group. And I'm sorry, I'll just take a second, but but I think this is a useful little tidbit. I did it with an intercontinental group, uh, some Belgians and some, and a couple people were British, but they were in Norway, and and they just didn't feel comfortable giving me thorns. I had to find different ways to ask for that information because they're like, oh, it was all great, we had a great time, it's great. I'm like, no, 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 I don't really want the compliments. Just tell me what I did wrong so I can fix those. Uh, so that that's you know you got to find the new way to draw it out of people. I think maybe the more informal way that you do a J is better, but I, I like cheat cheat cards, no cards. I like ratings. I right, like right. Ratings. So speaking of Chris, Jim. Uh, so we're going to hit up with the next question. This is from Jerry Grayson, uh, who's the the mastermind behind Capera Publishing. Um, he asked, "How much responsibility?" Do players have versus the game master in contributing to the beginning of a game, like plots, connections, setting details, all that stuff? How much should you should the players wear? Ooh, okay. So now, now we have another one of the, the, these hard conversations. Um, I, I've I've frequently called myself an antagonist in a world full of protagonists because my belief on this is contrary to a lot of people. So I, this is my my, my third uh, my, my, my third warning from the beginning. This is my personal preference. I'm not saying this is the way it should be, and there's probably panelists on this panel that disagree with me. Um, but. I actually hold um, that most of the power should be in the GM seat. Uh, because me, as a GM, I am coming to the table with a story to entertain you. I am coming with something to make a good experience. Now, having said that, before we have the first dice hit the table, all of the powers in the players. Everything they want from their backstory, everything they want from the character, it's yes, 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 yes. You want it, it's yours. But we're establishing all that before we get to session one when I play. That's in a, a session zero or in our, our, our talks beforehand. I will give them the, you know, the, the overarching idea. Again, the, the L5R game I ran for one shot, it was, okay, you all are going to do an investigation between, there's a land dispute between the Crab Clan and the Spider Clan. And that's what you're going to do. Go make your characters. And then we workshop our characters from there. And then once we start, again, it, it, it's me. I, I, at that point, control the world. I, at that point, control which direction the story is going. Now, again, for those who listen to it, you know, uh, players can very much derail it. And, and the real key to, to running that style, which is the way I do, is you have to be malleable with the story and you have to follow the interests of the players. I always have a direction I'm going, but rarely do I ever get to the finale I have in mind. I'm always trying to get to one, but maybe one out of four times do I get to the one I envision, and I, instead I get to the ones the players envision, which to me is the better finale. Now, if they don't contribute something to it, we still get to my finale and get to, to an engaging time. So it's, I, again, I, I call myself an antagonist in a world full of protagonists because not everyone agrees with that line of thought, but that's the way I come into it and approach it. Fair. I mean, and there are lots of ways to skin a cat. No offense, Kristen. Uh, Bree, how about you? Um, my general uh, perspective on it is that I am there to play your NPCs, embody your enemies, and ask you good questions. From that point on, you're on your own. I want the players to be as GMs as much as I am because it's not my story. It's their story. And uh, I've encouraged very much with my personal design so whenever you're creating games, the players have to input a lot of information. And then the GM who is running the story will basically just support them and get their questions to move along, like asking them what they see whenever they're doing something or what they're thinking, and kind of providing the antagonist, but only when the players are looking for one. 
So, Bree, I, I want to ask you on that one. Um, what about players that aren't necessarily comfortable with narrative authority? They really kind of want to, you know, sit behind the eyes of their character, and so they really want that GM to push on things. How do you adjust for that? I try to push them a little bit myself, um, but I also get them to interact with other players. And whenever they see another player acting a lot, it typically encourages them to come out of their shell more. And whenever people still tend to have a little bit of difficulty, I let them just coast. There's nothing wrong with just enjoying the story from the sidelines. That's fair. That's fair. Kristen, what, what about you? What do you try to... What, what should the players bring to a game? Uh, well, I'm going to give the consulting answer if it depends, because <laughs> it, it really does vary so much depending on what kind of game you're playing. Um, if you sat down to play a game of Fiasco, for example, with Jim's thing of, like, I've got an ending in mind, that would just be kind of ridiculous, right? Because everyone's, everyone's creating the story together and figuring it out. Um, I think my, my preference, though, would be uh, our games that are more collaborative with the players. Um, and to reiterate what Bree said, asking good questions is a huge part of it. Uh, so you might like have some vague ideas or some setting ideas, you know, to, to kick things off. But really, like poking at the players and being like, "What is it like in this area? And and who who's the bad guy? And who are the good guys? And, and like going around the table and kind of getting different different input via questions. Um, and that, that's a good way. To, if someone is is feeling intimidated too, you can ask them a simpler question. Just be like, "Is it morning or night? You know, and give them a, a yes or no question and get them started creating um, instead of needing to create something from late scratch. Cool, cool. I like that that seeding it in. That's that's good, Kristen. Jay, what about you? What what should the players bring? What do they? What do you expect from them? Um, for me, uh, I I don't want to know how the game ends. I never show up with the plot or the story or any of that stuff. It's all uh, we put it all together collaboratively, and uh, so I want them all to bring the stuff that they want to play, the stuff that they're interested in. And uh, that first session, we talk through that. Uh, first couple of sessions, we're finding our legs to figure out where we're going, what is uh, the thing we're collaboratively after, um, and then we run it down. Um, I'm uh, uh, The game works for me if I don't know how it ends, if I don't know where we're going or, or where we're, we're all working it out. Um, that, that's the magic for me. I can't, uh, I can't play knowing uh, where the rails are. That hurts my head. So, Jay, I'm going to follow up on that because, like, with most people who say, well, I don't have a plan of what's going on, I often kind of say, okay, well, that's the game choice. That's the game they chose to run, the, the actual mechanics, the way the game is written. But mm -hmm. for some reason, you, you're you saying you're doing that, but I, I've seen you run Burning Wheel, yeah, Star yeah. Wars Edge of the Empire. Yeah. Those are, like, system mastery type games. How do you pull that off? So, if... The rules handle all the decision points, right? I don't have to really decide a lot of uh, where the friction points are, whether you grab something or uh, are you winning this conflict. The rules, if I mean, if they're there, I'm going to read it, uh, play it as written guy. So I'm not going to drift anything. I'm going to play it as the rules are. For the rest, um, we're going to come up with situations that we're going to play, and um, we'll just play it through until the point we hit a conflict. And then we have the rules for that. Right? What do the rules say about this particular thing? Right? If we do that, I don't have to put a plot together. Um, maybe I need to come to the table with the initial situation, but if we've been playing a while, right, uh, or we've all come to play, everybody's coming to the table with something. And uh, I think my job then is to pull those things together and try to figure out how to mash them together or mash them up together, along with the things that I'm invested in messing around with or playing with. And then we put it all out on the table like a like a big stew or something. So, so you put stew on the table. Yes, because we're hungry. Yes. Well, my place would be yes. yes. Oh man, you got all crazy fuzzy on me, Jay. Uh, all right. Hopefully that was just a, a quick burp. So Jerry Grace had another question, and I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with you, Jay, and I may kind of phrase around it here to make sure it makes sense. So how do you, as a GM, build the build the excitement in the group during the beginning of a of a game session campaign to make sure that when you start it up, everybody is is fired up and really wants to buy into the game as as you see it or as you think everybody is is headed towards. Right. 
uh, I think this is where that that initial game talk uh, pays off. If we're all talking, you're gonna you're gonna tell if you're listening at the beginning uh, if what you've pitched is good or not. Everyone's either gonna buy in up front or they're gonna tap out and then we'll pick another game and go a different direction. Um, but if the conversation catches right, and for me, I will usually uh, Star Wars. That's the game we're playing. I've already sat down. I've already gone through the book, and I'm like, oh, I love this. I love this. I want to play with that. I want to see what this is about. So I have a list of things. You already know the huts are, are a soft spot for me. I love the huts. And so uh, that excites me. So when we had our first meeting online and we talked about some things, that enthusiasm is carrying across. You guys start uh, working with that, and, and you're bringing your own. And then uh, we're all jazzed about the same game but different angles of it, and I'm just capturing it all. So I remember to bring all those things everyone was excited about every session, and we keep moving on those things, we keep hitting on those things. Um, and that way it stays fresh and exciting. Nice. It's pretty easy. I mean, who doesn't love the hot? So it's just so, like, squeezable. <laughs> at the beginning, it's squeezable. Them. Yes. They're lovable at the beginning. Yeah, yeah pretty much, yeah. Uh, so, Krista, what about you? You know, when you sit down at a table and somebody didn't get the four or five slots that they, they wanted in Games on Demand and you're sitting there running that <laughs> game, how do you get them bought into your thing? Uh, so, like I said earlier, if you pretend to be confident, no one will really know you're not confident. Uh, it's similar with energy, I think, and excitement. If you pretend to be excited, people will probably just assume you really are excited. Uh, so, I think, uh, especially when you're doing just a one-shot and it's a short session with people you don't know, um, trying to bring as much energy as you can, even if you only slept three hours the night before and, and didn't get enough coffee or whatever. Um, stand up if you need to. I like to kneel on chairs sometimes and get up a little bit. Uh, yeah, whatever you, whatever you can do to... to even if you don't actually feel that way, pretend to be happy, pretend to be excited to be there, uh, have some energy, get off your feet. Um, that, that'll, that'll help. Cool, cool. Jim, what about you? How do you, how do you build that excitement? If, so let's say it's not L5R. Well, I, then I have no answer. I have no Curve answer. Ball. Now, I know there are other games that you've read, at least. No, no, no um, I, 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 want to, I, I want to start by um, uh, seconding Chris Ning's point so much. Um, you know, the, the energy level that the DM brings to the table has so much influence on the players. Um, it, it, it really does. And it's not easy for everyone to bring that kind of high energy level. Um, but it is one of the, 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 the big things, you know, to me, I believe, that really gets people going, gets people interested, gets people energetic. I mean, when I'm at the game table, you see me just like this. I'm, I'm doing my, my super fast Irish talking. My hands are doing this. I'm describing things. We're getting into it. We are bringing energy and excitement to the table, and it makes me so happy because I'm here to play. And that really does go a long way to make it happen. Um, so, so first and foremost, I want to second Kristen's part. And then, uh, of course, I have to go and second Jay's point because, uh, <laughs> as I've seemingly stall for an answer. Uh, but no, because um, I do obviously, you know, L5 or even other settings uh, that are lore heavy, you get character buy-in even before you get to the first play session. You know, you have to take into account how much time and effort the players have put into thinking about their character, creating their character before they get to the first, and they really want to get them involved. Now, one of the big things that I like to do uh, with games when I'm not running L5R um, is, is what I do is our, our world creation up to that point. And I actually take our characters and I go, okay, we are going to be in, in the town of, of Shallow Bottom Port. Okay. Now, what we're actually going to do is I spend about the first 30 minutes of the session, if it's not a one-shot, if I'm getting to a big campaign, and I go, okay, uh, 400 years ago this town was formed and such and such happened. How did your parents get here, or how did you get here if you're playing an elf that has a long lifespan? And then we literally go through the stages of this town and the current events. Okay, there was, you know, at the point that you're alive and in the town, there, there was a mayor election, and it was between this guy with this ideals and this guy with this ideals. Who did you support? And based on they, who they support, that determines who the mayor. And then he appointed this tax collector that did this. What was your encounter with him? And by the end of that, they feel like they are part of this town. They have their character. They have their setting. They know what they're doing. I'm bringing energy. And when we hit the, the, the gun that says go, it's just full force moving forward. So that's one of the things I like to do. Well, that's pretty neat. I like that kind of setting, build, player engagement. That's really cool, Jim. Uh, Bree, what about you? How do you uh, bring that energy to kick things off? This is actually one of the biggest challenges for me. 
um, for two reasons. The first is that I probably about 90% of my games has been there were no other games left, so I got stuck in yours. And <laughs> the other reason is I'm not very good at pulling energy. Um, I'm not very animated. I'm not really competent. So I have to kind of pull it from the players as much as I give in. And what I tend to find in the games that I've run, especially one-shots, is having the players build their characters and build the world at the start of the game tends to get them invested very quickly, especially because they know they're going to have to do it really quick before they finish the game. Um, knowing that you have a window of like four hours whenever you've just built an entire world from scratch in about ten minutes tends to get people pretty excited because they're heated for what happens. And that's that's about the only way I've managed to make it happen. <laughs> that's a pretty cool way. That's cool. I, I so I'm gonna you you ever see one of those things where someone shows you and you can't unsee it. This I'm gonna curse some people who play games with me in the future by revealing that one of my dirty secrets to get people excited for a game when I first meet them is as soon as possible I'm going to have a character with a funny voice that I play. Uh because at that point, you see that I'm so committed to try to have a good time that I'm going to make an idiot out of myself. That's, that's pretty much that's my commitment level to the people at that table for our ephemeral experience that will only exist for a few moments unless we put it on YouTube. So it's, it's funny voices are pretty powerful. Okay. Yeah, to to kind of add to what, what I said earlier, but, but with what Bree said, um, yeah, if you can't if you can't bring your own uh, excitement, you can at least be excited about choices that the players make. So when they decide, for my example of night or day, that it's day, you're like, yes, that's perfect, and, and that's sort of another way like to, to bring in that excitement without needing to bring a lot forward. Yeah, they're too, though, I'm definitely an entertainer, and I think Brute Bree's very thoughtful, and I think those are two very different and <laughs> interesting ways for for people to GM. So. Uh, so Paul Edson asked a question. I think I want to lead off with you, Kristen, if we could. If you're running a one shot or a con game, how do you start in a way that will immediately grab the players uh, that you know you only have a, a few hours to, to make great stories with? I mean, it's similar to the question from before, but is there anything specific to the con session or one shot that you do? Uh, yeah, I, I used to, well, I still am an improvised theater performer uh, and teacher and that stuff, and we have a rule of thumb in improv that I think works well for this, which is to start in the middle. Uh, so when you're on improv doing a scene and you have a couple minutes, uh, you don't you don't want to start with like someone knocking on the door and coming in and shaking hands and saying, hi, I'm so-and-so, and I'm so-and-so, because that, that kind of eats up dead time. Uh, you really want to start in the middle of like a conversation or an argument or, or something's already happening. Uh, and you don't want to rehash what you did kind of in the intro. Like if you already know two people are arguing over the line in between their houses because they're neighbors, you don't want to like have someone out there being like, oh, I'm just noticing this for the first time. You want them to be like, I don't know, catching things on fire and already in the middle, <laughs> middle of it. So I think as much as you can, starting starting in the middle of like that relationship, of that of that conflict, of the fun thing you're doing, exciting, it doesn't all have to be conflict, uh, but but yeah, don't don't build up to something, don't rehash something you did in an intro, start, start in the middle, start in the middle. Rule of thumb. <laughs> okay, cool. Bree, what about you? I mean, you, you kind of tackle this a little bit, but anything specifically tailored to to a one shot or con session? Kristen makes obviously a ton of good points because she's like an expert on this kind of thing. Um, particularly uh, my game Clash that I've been working on for like three years and done nothing with. Uh, the the entire point of the game is it's a game about conflict, and I've run it a couple of cons um, multiple times, and the the big thing you do whenever you start the game is you set up who is fighting over what and what team you're on. And then you kind of set them at each other like mad dogs, and it goes pretty excitingly. <laughs> but I've, I've tried to replicate that with other games by finding the kind of questions that people have and making those into a big goal and angling people as much as I can, player to player and player to NPC giving them relationships immediately that they have to resolve something in. Otherwise, you know, people tend to get bored if they don't have something to aim for right away. Cool, cool. I like that. Aiming for stuff right away, that's that's really good. I, I think the what do you do part that I stole from Apocalypse World has been in, incredibly useful for, to help me figure out how to phrase a thing to players early on. It's to make sure that there's an action that comes after my blathering mouth of, of words. 
uh, Jim, what what about you? What, um, in a one shot or con session, how do you lead off strong? You know, the the number one thing to me is you have to get the players taking action as soon as physically possible. The, the, the point where you turn over the game where you're no longer narrating the beginning, you're no longer you know doing setting building, and they are actively doing something. And, and that, I think, is, is one of the big keys to, to get them moving and to get them engaged with, you know, what's going on. Um, you know, I, I, of course, uh, Kristen came at it from the, uh, you know, the, the, the improv world. I'll, I'll come at it with, with the same conclusion, though, uh, from the literary world, which is in media res. Uh, you know, c coming at it from a section of, you know, okay, all of the little backstory, we are playing tabletop, and especially at a one-shot or especially at a con game, you know, okay, all of the, the meat at the tavern, and stuff, we don't need to spend time on it. Okay, you all have agreed from the wizard to go kill the ogre. You are now in the woods moving forward, or you know, okay, you need to now go supply, you know, these people in the town, yada, yada, yada. Go. Let's get things moving forward and giving them agency of the story, the agency of their action as soon as possible, because the longer that you get from start to that point, you just get dwindling interest and dwindling energy. You have to get them engaged so they know it's their story, and that way you can start building it up the other side. So, I mean, that, that would be the big thing to me that hasn't, of course, already, already been said by the, our other two wonderful panelists. Fair, fair. Yeah, I, I mean, you're building on it, but I think it's a really important point to touch on. Jay, um, what about you, sir? Any con or, or one-shot uh, specific tips that you have? Oh, you're muted, sir. Sure, sure. Uh, for con games, uh, uh, everyone's already stolen my answers, so I, I, I've been rehashing everything. But No, it all comes down to situation. Um, I will start with a strong, immediate situation. Uh, try to keep that delivery two or three sentences, and then we're off and playing. Um, so uh, there's a heist uh, you have to go do. Um, you're part of a thieves guild. Everyone, you know, is in. We need you to steal this thing and run off with it. Now we're off and running. I've done that, and uh, so for me, it's the situation. If we go in with a hot, strong situation, um, those those next three or four hours, everyone's engaged and. Uh, um, and then that works for me. Yeah. Lady Blackbird, to me, is the epitome of the best way to kick off a con session. That little Star Wars crawl, you know, that you have. Right, right. I, I love that. I'll be honest with you. I, it's like my favorite part of the game is reading that aloud. Like it's, <laughs> Everything else happens after is pretty great, but I know that part's going to be good. And it, it really does help. Um, so... We'll lead off with the last question that was submitted, and again, we're, uh, we're going to have a minute or two here, so if you haven't asked a question through the Q&A, feel free to, to pipe that in. Uh, but for now, we will end off with Andrew Fish asked, uh, do you start with an idea of a satisfying way for a campaign specifically to end? Now, I'm going to tailor that, Andrew, I'm sorry, but we got some people who are more one-shot related, so I think you know, thinking about beginning a one-shot towards how you're going to end it is also useful. So we'll speak to campaign, but also uh, to one-shots. And so do you do you start with an idea of how to end that campaign, and how do you move in that direction? Now, Jim, I think you already talked about you had you know a few endings in mind. So tell us, how is it that you guide it, or how do you as a GM make sure that it's, it's headed towards what you feel like might be the most satisfying conclusion for the majority of the group, or yourself, you know, whichever is more important? <laughs> we know that answer. Um, no, the, the um, I, I am I am very big on. Obviously, you've heard me say I, I believe in, in in. I don't want to say a pre-planned ending. I believe in a direction to a conclusion because I am very narratively driven myself. I have to have story, and story needs finale, and story needs conclusion. And if I don't get finale and conclusion, I don't feel completeness. And there are a lot of people, um, you know, that that have that same concept. So when I go into a story, I'm thinking about more than anything else, the three-act structure. You know, uh, my, my first act, my first third of the story, whether I'm playing a one-shot, whether I'm playing a campaign, whatever the case is, my first third is giving them information on where they are and who's involved. 
And then my second act is when we're actually getting into the what I call the, the meat and potato side of it. You know, we, we are now doing events. There's victories for the heroes. There's victory for the villains. And this all builds up into our finale. So, you know, when I go into, you know, I, I keep bringing it up just because people could actually go and listen to it. But but the one shot I did for with L5R for uh, the, the one shot podcast, you know, there was a finale. And I'll tell you what the finale was. There was going to be a duel between James D'Amato and Cat Murphy's character. And they were going to have to fight to the death. That was the, the decided finale and two hours before Cat Murphy dropped out of the campaign so we are still trying to progress towards an ending and I had an ending in mind and that ending didn't even come close to happening because of character action so I had an ending at every stage I had an ending but it changed regularly and I had to adapt to the player so I'm always looking at that three act structure so I'm building up to something even though that something seems to change minute by minute at the table Jim, I just want to ask, are there points where the die roll completely flies in the face of where you think the game's going to end, and how do you adjust to that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I say all the time, I do generally run uh, more serious and more role-play heavy games, um, so there are die roll decisions, and again, I won't spoil the end, but the ending of the game was decided, the outcome of the finale was decided by a die roll. Um, in, in this type game, and the idea is to allow those sessions or th those events to occur, and they do occur quite regularly. My biggest thing to, because of course the concern with having a pre-established plot and a pre-established finale is, are you railroading? Are you, you know, not giving player agency and story? That's the big concern. And where I come it from, I am trying to set up interesting, engaging situations, and the players have 100% on the control of the outcome of those situations and that's the big key difference it's I'm setting up the, the mid-level fight it's up to them whether they win the fight lose the fight or, or whatever the alternative outcome may be um, you know same thing when I go into a finale even if I'm doing a campaign where I'm having a finale and the next part of the campaign is going to begin it's okay we have our finale but you as the players have 100% power on what the outcome is and what the story will be from there just as at the end of the first act whatever that event you have complete control over what the second act is going to be, I just in mind keep track of a direction that I'm going and what should be occurring in these acts so we get a nice narrative arc. Nice, nice. Bree, what about you? Are there any ways that you have games where you have an ending in mind and how do you coax it towards that? I generally try not to have an ending in mind. Um, I like to let the characters go as freely as they can. Um, I might have a theme or, like, I've tried in the past to have points in the game that I want people to hit, uh, like certain scenes I'd like to see happen or something like that. Um, but as far as, like, a solid ending, I try to avoid that. Um, and part of the reason for that is that I like to be surprised by the character's action as much as they are, basically. Um, if I'm not wanting to write fan fiction about your character, the game's probably not that exciting. And <laughs> so I, I try to step back and let people lead to their own endings as much as possible. Oh man, fan fiction. See, you need play by post, Bree. You need play play because you're already writing fanfic about the characters, and they are too. Just saying, play by post is awesome. Okay, Jay, what about you, sir? Uh, what What about you? Any Any feedback on uh, guiding towards an ending without you know railroading? I uh, so in my normal home games, I never I never pick an ending. Um, because I can't do it, because I, I want to know how it ends. I don't, I don't want to pick the ending, and I don't want to drive to an ending. But in con games, you kind of have to, to have a good, satisfying four-hour slot. Everyone walks away, there's an ending there, nothing's hung over. So I struggle with this. Um, my current uh, technique is to watch the time. Um, in three hours, right, uh, I should have a good idea of where I can, where, where all the ends are and start picking them to tie them up and, and, and figure out where the, the climax is um, so I can kind of bring things to an end and, and, and be done or, or have a good ending for everything. Um, most of the time that works out. Sometimes that just I, it just gets crazy and I can't pull it off. Uh, so I don't have anything nice there. Uh, Com games are hard for me to do that with, but at my home games, um, everything kind of runs in arcs and it will organically... Uh, close themselves, and we start, we start new arcs, and we just keep going, or we're starting new games. Um, 
we have a uh, Burning Wheel uh, All Dwarfs game that's 20, 22 sessions in, and there are several arcs in that game. There's no one big ending. Uh, where they are now is far different than where they started. So, um, And I don't know if I could have done that if I had an ending in mind. Um, but like I said, with con games, it's different, and I kind of want to shut it down so you could have a the end on the end of it, but that's hard. Yeah, it is. Question though, in the all dwarf game, I have to know how many how many people are doing a Scottish brogue. <laughs> I might have one doing the Scottish brogue. <laughs> how many plots have you had about beer? Uh, every, I, I would say uh, for uh, beer, beer comes up every session, all the time. Yes. Okay, so it's not plot oriented; it's color. <laughs> That's what you're saying? Okay, that's important. Yes. I'm glad that you're hitting the touchstones, man. Good job. Uh, so, Kristen, bring us home here. What What are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I have a, a few tips for, for con games and, and, and one-shots uh, to help with endings. Um, I think uh, first uh, on the list of three things is set expectations at the beginning. You might know that you're going to get through character setup and one round of scenes, depending on how complicated the game is. Uh, so let people know ahead of time, hey, this is probably how far we're going to get. This will be how things might wrap up differently. Uh, Second, I think uh, one thing that you can do, as Jay said, you definitely have to keep an eye on the time, uh, but one thing you can do is give players a choice. Uh, you don't always know what's going on in players' heads or what's interesting to them, so if you realize, hey, there's only an hour left and there's, they could finish what they're doing now, which is going to take a while, or we, I had this other thing in my back pocket, you might want to take a pause and say, hey, are you really into what you're doing now? Do you want to do that for another half an hour? Or I have another thing, we could just kind of summarize this and move on to the other thing, and you don't really know what they're going to choose. Um, so the table might be excited about something that surprises you, so that's uh, sort of tip number two. And then uh, number three, last but not least, um, epilogues are a, a secret trick that I've learned from other <laughs> Games on Demand GMs. Uh, if you've got 15 minutes or so, uh, maybe maybe 20 minutes, depending on if you're on a con and people need to get somewhere else, you say, okay, that's as far as like the real game we're going to get, but we want to wrap this up, so everyone think, think of an ending for your character, uh, and then give them a moment to think and go around the table, and everyone gets two sentences, three sentences, and says, this is what happened to my character. And then regardless of the kind of game it was, you can slap that on at the end, and everyone feels like they had this like awesome conclusion for their character in the story, and it feels like it reached an end, even, you know, even if you're cheating a little. That, when John Stavropoulos first did that, for me at a game, it was amazing because it, it, not perfectly, but it does help you kind of put to bed the whole, I want to play this character again thing, like we can actually epilogue a little bit, so that's, that's a great Chris, I'm so glad you brought that one up. Uh, Alright, so that's all the questions that we have submitted, did anybody have like a closing statement that they wanted to bring before we bring this to close? I don't know. I just threw that out there. I have no idea. I thought Jim had a closing statement. <laughs> you, you want me to tell an epilogue? Well, Jim McClure, he was this great podcaster, and then he said the wrong thing, and they never allowed him to come back. It was a tragic ending. Oh, man, that stinks. That's my heart. It's like Firefly. We never got that second season. One uh, day. I'm still holding hope. <laughs> don't bother. All right, so here's a comic book for you. Um, so thanks, everybody. So, Bree, you've got the IGDN uh, and the podcast you're doing, right? Is there any other places that people can find more from you? Um, there's the Indie Syndicate podcast through IGDN. Um, we're currently on Patreon. Um, I will try to post public posts on my G Plus about that this evening or tomorrow morning. Um, I also can be found at BreeCS.com. Uh, that's B R I E C S, um, and um, I also post a total amazing amount of stuff on my G Plus. So <laughs> uh, if you want to follow me there, very cool, very cool. Jim, RBG Academy, GM Academy. Are there any other academies you run? You like the <laughs> Dean Kuba? The, the I, I guess I'll, I'll plug two things. If you follow me on Twitter, GM Jim McClure, um, if, if you can remember that. Um, and, and the one other thing I want to plug, just because it's, it, it's a big thing going on, uh, VirtuaCon. If anyone's going to be near Ohio, uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, or I'm sorry, I already said now I have to plug VirtuaCon coming up in a couple months. And uh, Rich, when is that? Is it October? 
That's in November. I was like, November. wait, it's in Cincinnati this year? I thought it was on the internet. <laughs> well, it's in Cincinnati too, but I, I, miss, <laughs> I, I have to plug uh, our, our Catacon, uh, which is in Cincinnati, uh, Oxford, Ohio by Cincinnati, uh, which will be like the second weekend in November, so now I'm not hoping there's there's a conflict there, but uh, we, we are going to be doing, we'll have to say, um, we're, we're going to be doing a big uh, L5R super show, actually, the, the people for one shot that did the first part, we're going to be recording a part two. We're actually going to have Sean Carmen, who's been the head writer of Legend of Five Rings for the last decade is going to be there. Um, so I'm going to be running games with him, and it's going to be just an L5R good time, as well as I think they're running other games too, but I, I can't pay attention to any of that. <laughs> Got to focus, right? Got to focus um, on the important things. So Kristen, I know it's jadegirl.com. Any other places Jade that people... Jadegirl.com, which if my name is popping up should be right under my name. Yeah, I've got a couple of games that I've written up there, uh, but mostly you can find me at various conventions at Games on Demand. Uh, I go to Gen Con every year. Uh, I'm, I'm an invited GM to Big Bad Con this year. The Kickstarter's still up. Sean Nittner runs that, Big Bad Con. It's four more days. You can donate to the Kickstarter and uh, come see me out in California in October. Uh, yeah, and I just want to, like, Say almost everything I said today. Um, I really have learned from other GMs in this community, so uh, I'm not that smart. I'm just good at absorbing information. So thank you to everybody who's come before me, who, who's given me such such good, you know, people to examples to follow. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I steal all the time. Jay, when, when people want to know more, but they can't have you for the Star Wars game you're running for me, but other stuff, people want to know Jay, uh, where, where can they find out more things? I'm not on a G+, uh, Mad Jay Brown. Um, that's where I dump all my game stuff at, so you can find me out there. Cool, cool, cool. All right, well, thank all of you for coming. Thank you, everyone who submitted questions. Uh, it was a pleasure. I learned a lot from you guys and, uh, and gals. I appreciate that. And uh, thanks again. Now, if you're watching this and you think, hey, how can I get more awesome panels from Indie Plus? We've got a bunch. Just subscribe, which is beneath. Uh, there's a button here that says subscribe. My hand is passing it at some point. And uh, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. We have lots of content two years worth of panels on a monthly basis, I believe. Uh, so there's lots of other things as well as cool shows and demos of cool indie and small press games. So please do. Uh, thanks everybody for watching and I hope you have a great night. <laughs>